good afternoon. Uh, my name is Graham Allison. I'm the director of the BCSIA and former dean of the school. And it's a great honor to welcome uh, to the forum of the Harvard and the John F. Kennedy School of Government the Prime Minister of Slovenia, uh, Janos Donošek. Uh, we were just uh, chatting in the, uh, in the waiting room of the Institute of Politics, uh, uh, and the Prime Minister uh, uh, noted that it was just about 10 years ago uh, that he first got to know uh, Mr. Milosevic, uh, uh, when he, uh, the Prime Minister now, was the head of the presidency of Yugoslavia. So uh, we will have quite a lot of a basis for an interesting discussion today. And as we mentioned to the Prime Minister, uh, we're glad to have back at Harvard so many friends and uh, colleagues, particularly alumni of various programs, including folks from many parts of the world. So uh, this is a good, uh, a good combination, and we could hardly have a more timely uh, topic. The Prime Minister was uh, born in Slovenia in 1950. Uh, for those of us who were born sometime before that, this is uh, uh, always interesting as we watch this remarkable set of developments in Eastern and Central Europe. He completed his doctorate in economics then went to work for a major construction company as a director of a bank, as an economic advisor uh, in the Yugoslav embassy, and then ultimately as the Slovenian de delegate to the Assembly of Republics and Autonomous Regions of Yugoslavia, where, as I say, in 1989, he became president of the Yugoslavian Collective Presidency. After the Yugoslav army uh, under Mr. Milosevic attacked Slovenia, uh, uh, Mr. Dinošek withdrew from the presidency, and Slovenia withdrew and became an independent country. He became prime minister of Slovenia in April of 1992 and has served in that role since. Now, uh, as the Prime Minister knows, Americans are not the best at geography. Okay? And I'm not going to give you a quiz today, okay? but uh, only to note uh, that if you actually uh, were as aware as we would hope all Kennedy School students and alumni are, and even guests, uh, if I were to ask you which of the countries of Eastern and Central Europe has a single A credit rating with the international rating agencies. You might not think Slovenia, but that's the answer. Mm -hmm. That's the answer. If you were to uh, look at the agenda for NATO today and the issues of Kosovo, which uh, the Prime Minister will be turning to when he goes to Washington tomorrow, and say which of the countries uh, are most crucial in this set of developments. And the short list is Slovenia. If you look at the debate about NATO enlargement after the three, and say who comes up next, okay, and most uh, vividly. If you go to the EU agenda, so right across the, the spectrum, uh, Slovenia is now uh, coming into the spotlight, and so it's a great opportunity for us here at the Kennedy School to have the Prime Minister visiting, and we look forward to his remarks and then to questions and answers. So thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honored to be here today to speak uh, to this audience. And um, the, my team is today very much known. The problems in Balkans are, of course, the topics in international media. And um, as you heard in this introduction, I have exactly 10, ten years of experience uh, with this uh, problem, with this crisis, at least uh, direct experience uh, 
in as president of the then presidency and uh, later as prime minister of Slovenia. It's true, I met uh, Mr. Milosevic exactly 10 years ago and uh, uh, we represented different concepts and different models how to transform the then Yugoslavia. Uh, but it's, it's obvious uh, that uh, bad, bad guys are much, much more famous than good guys. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, today everybody is speaking about uh, Mr. Milosevic. Uh, and when, when uh, we speak or hear about Slovenia, Sometimes I, I say that Slovenia had a very good, uh, very good results, very good uh, standing, but it's not very much known in international media in the world. Usually, I say good news is not news for media, so we we don't appear in in media because we have <coughs> since 1991 we have normal developments. Uh, normal transition, good economic results, and uh, normal de uh, democracy. Uh, but this is also, this can be now, I, I should say, a very, a very clear comparison. What came out of the Slovenian model, which we represented in 1989, and the Serbian model, which was advocated by Mr. Milosevic, at, at that time. On one side, we have uh, the former Republic of Yugoslavia, Slovenia, uh, with uh, the performances, which, which have been mentioned, very, very good uh, financial economic performances as candidates for NATO, negotiating Uni European Union membership now as uh, probably the best uh, of, uh, of the best candidate. And on the other side, we have uh, a disaster, we have a war, we have uh, ethnic cleansing, we have massacres. And even for the first time after 50, 50 years, that NATO is directly invol involved in war activities against, against uh, Serbia. <clears throat> we, uh, when we met 10 years ago, uh, the Kosovo problem was already the biggest problem of the then Yugoslavia. The riots and uh, tensions in Kosovo uh, happened on a daily basis. There was, when I, I was su surprisingly elected as president of Yugoslav presidency 10 years ago, I found this extremely tense si situation with uh, already the state of emergency in Kosovo, with uh, military and uh, police forces in Kosovo, uh, trying to, to, to uh, establish some uh, peace uh, at the region. And uh, this was the time, this was the time when in Slovenia and Croatia, especially, uh, we started, we, we proposed a program of uh, multi-party elections, human rights protection, jo joining European integrations. And on the other side, it was, it was the time when Mr. Milosevic started his uh, political career with uh, nationalism, focusing on Kosovo problem saying that uh, Kosovo is the historical province of, Ser of Serbia, that uh, Serbs are losing ground on Kosovo, diminish the autonomy, the existing autonomy of the, re of the province of Kosovo in, in the framework of Serbia, and playing on emotions, on nationalistic emotions, on big historical images of Serbia, uh, this was quite often in history a, w a very easy, easy a way for leaders, authoritarian leaders, we can say dictators, to get the support, to play on this kind of emotions. I think that uh, uh, 
Minister Milosevic started his political career like this, with this kind of policy, politics, and uh, he continued it through all these 10 years. And now we are again at Kosovo. The Yugoslav crisis started 10 years ago with Kosovo, and it seems that it will finish with Kosovo. Uh, I remember that once I, I, I spoke to Mr. Milosevic, I, I told him that his policy, playing with nation, nationalism, playing with, uh, uh, with war, with possible war, it is like to, 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 to ride a tiger, to settle a tiger. When you do it, perhaps you can have uh, a good start, and, but uh, then is the question how to unsettle the tiger. What will happen then? Probably something very unpleasant. So I, I make this com uh, comparison because I, I think that with this kind of policy, he's all the time in the situation that it's very difficult to, to change from one political model, which is based on nationalistic emotions, historical emotions, and to, and to, to, to start with different one, a pragmatic, more democratic, more tolerant uh, model, uh, the one that, that is much more present in, in Western countries and the one that also Slovenia at the, at the time opted for. Uh, so the logic of this concept is going on and uh, Slovenia, after its proposals to transform the Yugoslavia, the Yugoslav Federation, into more democratic and also more loose confederation at that time, uh, Slovenia decided to declare independence together with Croatia in June 1991. And uh, after the sh short 10 days war, when Yugoslav army intervened in Slovenia, trying to stop this in independence, and after Slovenian people defended themselves successfully, and when we combined this defense with, uh, I think, good diplomacy, Slovenia really established independence. And uh, during the last eight years, we, we continued in, in the path that I tried to describe. The war moved from Slovenia to Croatia between Serbian entities in Croatia and Croats, and the Yugoslav army, which was uh, becoming more and more Serbian army, uh, confronted with Croatia. Then the war moved to Bosnia and Herzegovina, when we have even more complicated ethnic si uh, situation. Serbs, Muslims, Croats. You know what happened in Bosnia and Herzegovina, a war hundreds of thousands of people dead, millions of refugees. And now we have the last stage of this development in Kosovo, in Kosovo with, uh, again, massacres, ethnic cleansing, and uh, a lot of atrocities in Kosovo. <coughs> during this uh, situation, during these developments, especially in, when it started in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. There was a lot of discussion also in international international community, international forum, uh, what to do, how to stop this, uh, this violence. I must say that I was at that time already in 1992 an advocate of early intervention, military intervention, NATO intervention in Bosnia. Bosnia and Herzegovina. When it became clear that the war, that the war started, and it, that it will continue. And uh, this intervention happened, occurred only three years later, when NATO, NATO strike, st uh, strikes uh, uh, in, in Bosnia uh, together with uh, other developments with Croatian 
army becoming stronger and stronger. When the strikes uh, stopped the war in, 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 in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and then the Dayton agreements provided the basis then for the today's situation for the peace. I think that this could happen three years ago already. At least two years would be uh, much better. Uh, the problem is that during this war, after all these atrocities, so many, the, the people living there did so many things to each other that it is then extremely difficult to expect or to live together again. And here we come, I think, to the basic uh, question of the today's situation in, in the former Yugoslavia or in the Balkans. Is the Dayton uh, principle the right answer to what happened. The Dayton agreements and the Dayton principle means to restore the previous situation, to bring the refugees back, trying to uh, constitute uh, the democratic institution in the country, organize democratic uh, elections, and uh, trying to put the war criminals at the uh, Hague Tribunal. <coughs> In principle, uh, it is certainly the best and good solution in theory. But the problem is that, in, that practically it is extremely difficult to be implemented. And it needs a long international presence, military presence, and also Political, political efforts. We have now in, the, in Bosnia and Herzegovina the situation where Bosnia and Herzegovina is a state with three ethnic groups, entities, with practically, practically three states inside one state, and with uh, international forces supervising uh, the agreement and uh, securing the peace. But uh, no uh, or very slow developments towards the, uh, consolidation of the state. Uh, people are not coming back, or refugees from the Europe are coming back uh, reluctantly, especially in the regions where they represent a minority. So Croats don't uh, want to back to the regions where, where, where they lived before, but are now controlled by Serbs or vice versa, or Muslims. And it, it is, we can see that it's extremely, extremely difficult to restore the situation after such a long war. Uh, so certainly this will be uh, in discussion again quite soon. And I speak about this because we have the same questions now in the Kosovo situation. When uh, refugees left Kosovo, when there are a lot of atrocities, and now we are seeking all for the political solution for Kosovo, uh, discussing about, about bringing back the refugees and uh, discussing what should be then the political solution. Can we expect that Serbs and Albanians will live in Kosovo again after this war, when it was almost impossible to live together even before these NATO strikes and before this uh, exodus uh, started and uh, before these new atrocities in, in the region. So this is, I think, um, one question that uh, doesn't have the answer at the moment. And I expect, and I also I cannot see other uh, possibility than to establish a certain transitional solution in Kosovo after the war. First, of course, the, the war must finish. Certain transitional solution, which would be practically an international protectorate for Kosovo, including with international forces, and when probably after, after some years, after several years, uh, in the new, hope, hopingly more normal situation, uh, Albanians and also Serbs will be able to decide about, about, the, uh, about their state, about uh, the status of Kosovo, 
about all these major political issues. And I can't see, I can't see other short-term solution. <clears throat> Today, uh, this problem is the problem which will probably uh, be in the focus also in the NATO summit. These days in Washington, the summit will start this Saturday in Washington. Also, I will participate there. Slovenia is a, a partner of NATO and, uh, as we mentioned, one of the strongest candidates for the membership. And, uh, of course, there are the questions, what, what influence will, have, will this crisis have on NATO and uh, its future role in international politics. Uh, this will be largely decided by the developments now, by the outcome of the Kosovo crisis. Basically, I can see two alternatives for, for the moment for the solution in Kos for the situation in Kosovo. One is the political one. And this could only be to bring Russia again in the process of uh, political negotiations and uh, to bring uh, United Nations and Security Council in these uh, negotiations. And, uh, that, and uh, the only possible political solution is that Belgrade, that Serbia would accept the presence of international forces in Kosovo but sponsors, sponsored, I think the possible compromise could be that these forces could, would be sponsored by United Nations Security Council and also other countries, not only NATO countries, would participate in, this, in these forces. This is still a p possible political solution of the problem, although it is becoming more and more difficult because of the because also Milosevic is uh, demona now demonized in, 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 the, in the international media. It's becoming more and more unacceptable part partner also for the political solution. And it will be more and more difficult then at a certain point to stop uh, military attacks and start to negotiate again with him and to sign some, sign some agreement. So I'm, I'm even not sure if it is still possible, uh, but I can see only this possibility for, for, for a political solution. The other would be, the other scenario would be the acceleration of war. It is the logic of war. It means that uh, air attacks will accelerate and at a certain point uh, ground tro troops will be introduced in, in Kosovo, that NATO, NATO would intervene um, this is not the question, is it good or bad, but I think that it is the logic of the situation. When the first step has been, has been done, the second must follow and the third. Otherwise, also the first step will be questions why it has been done. It, it would be wrong to do it and then not to finish it, then to, to find yourself in a worse situation than before. So uh, these are the questions that I expect will be discussed also these days. And um, I must say that I would still opt for the first solution, for the political solution of the problem. I think it would be very important to bring Russia back in certain partnership with NATO. NATO and the whole international community invested a lot in partnership with Russia during the last decade. Now this partnership uh, was very much, uh, very much put in question. Developments in Russia are, are not very clear. Internal political situation is, is not very uh, predictable. And uh, uh, <coughs> I think uh, that anti-reformist anti, anti or anti-American or anti-NATO NATO 
feelings and rhetorics now uh, certainly will not uh, will not help will not be helpful to improve the international international stability so i think it is still time somehow to bring russia back in this in this position in partnership position and also to bring security council and united nations back in this process so this would be a preferable sol a solution but uh, I'm not sure that this will happen and this still can happen uh, in, in, the present, in the present situation, but I think that a lot of us will work in this direction. And perhaps I would st uh, stop at this point and I'm ready to, of course, to answer your question. So for, for those of us who watch these events uh, from uh, Boston or uh, other capitals or uh, cities in the world, to hear from somebody that's living this experience on the front line for a decade is, a, is remarkable. And you uh, speak of it, it seems to me, in such uh, thoughtful, careful, uh, uh, insightful ways. So I think we have a great opportunity here to learn a lot this afternoon. The Prime Minister is happy to take uh, questions. Questions uh, should be from anybody here, but you should please identify yourself and make sure one question and not too long. There'll be opportunities for speeches, but that's after we conclude tonight. So if you want to propose to give a speech, I'll uh, ask you to wait until after we finish. And you should please stand up at the microphones both on the ground floor and their microphones on the first balcony floor, too. Please, here. Thank you. Um, Jack Peterson, I'm a 97 graduate from the Kennedy School. Uh, my question on the political solution. Uh, what does Milosevic have to gain from accepting a political solution? If he does accept one under these terms that you prescribe with international forces in Kosovo, does he not look like the one who lost? And therefore, does not his position get so weakened internally that he would basically lose his power? And for somebody who seems to me is very much uh, power interested and power centered, that what is there for him to, to accept that kind of solution? I could see only one reason. It is uh, to avoid uh, real defeat, real military defeat, and with all consequences that would bring uh, I'm, I must say I'm not sure that he will accept uh, or he will accept such an exit now out of this situation if, if, if this will be offered. Because there is um, uh, indeed very difficult to, to stop. Uh, in Slovenia we can follow also the TV, the Serbian TV, we can see how, what, what, what kind of propaganda, war propaganda is going on every day. And it's, it's really difficult to stop this at a certain moment and to say, okay, now we will, we will uh, talk about peace and accept the conditions that we haven't accepted uh, one month ago. Of course, this is difficult to, to answer the why, why then the war was necessary. Now, now we, we come very close to the solution that was proposed at the Rambouillet negotiations, Rambouillet agreement. So it's not easy. So I can, uh, that's why I'm also not sure that it will happen. And uh, the reason to accept it would be really that um, one can foresee a much worse situation than for Serbia uh, with uh, probably the ground troops involved. And I, I think that uh, this kind of solution could happen in the framework of the preparations for ground troop uh, intervention. So at certain point where it would be very clear that otherwise uh, there would be military uh, intervention on the ground. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jennifer Wilson, I'm a student at the Kennedy School and I was part of the Kosovo Observer Mission. I'm wondering what you see as the difference between the justification for Slovenian independence versus Kosovar independence. Yeah. 
perhaps you think it's justified? <laughs> no, there are some more problems involved uh, with uh, Kosovo independence. It was not uh, easy at that time with Slovenian independence in these circumstances, but certainly it's not easy now for Kosovo and um, also for international community to, to accept it. There is a question, what would it mean? Would there be independent Kosovo and uh, it is Albanian state and there is already one uh, Albanian state, would there be two Albanian states then? Uh, it, it seems that, uh, that the Kosovars are not very keen to join Albania in one state and there is also the question of uh, Albanians in Macedonia. I think that uh, Macedonia now is really in difficult situation and uh, it is destabilized a lot with refugees, with extremely difficult economic situation because of this war and uh, this is one of, uh, of the justified uh, reasons also for the international community to be very cautious. So the situation of Macedonia. Uh, but uh, speaking uh, frankly, I can't see how now, after this war especially, Albanians in Kosovo and Serbs can live together again in one state. Uh, but because of the, of the reasons I mentioned, uh, I think that the most likely solution is a transitional solution for Kosovo, as it was meant by Ramboye agreement, with a possibility of independence then after a after certain time. Probably uh, Kosovars would not be, also in practical terms, uh, now ready to, to establish their own state. And having in mind, mind, in mind all political, uh, reasons I mentioned, uh, it's, it's very likely that the, there would be a transitional political uh, solution and then at a certain point a final, a final decision. Please, on the balcony, uh, Piper, and, and identify yourself, yes. My name is Piper Campbell. I'm in the mid-career program here at the Kennedy School. Previously, I was working in Eastern Slavonia, and people sometimes would get confused and think I was in Slovenia and tell me how lucky I was to be working in such a beautiful country. <laughs> My question is about, um, so if you could elaborate on your rationalization for suggesting UN forces opposed, as opposed to NATO. Is it purely pragmatic that it would be easier to persuade the Serbs to accept that, or are there other reasons that you believe there, that a UN force would be, uh, would be preferred to a NATO force? It would be a face-saving solution for Serbs. They must have, if they are supposed to accept certain political agreement, they must have some face-saving. And saying that it will not be NATO, NATO would be considered now as an occupying force in, in Serbia. So uh, UN-sponsored UN forces could be uh, seen and explained uh, uh, differently, especially with the Russian presence there. And second, as I said, uh, uh, this would bring also Russia back in this process. Perhaps some, somebody would say it's not, it's not good, but on the other side, I think uh, it's important to, to keep or to, to try, try to uh, uh, rebuild this partnership, uh, NATO partnership with Russia. So this also would be, I think, an important reason for international stability as a, as a whole. Hi, my name is Jonathan Taylor. I'm a grad student at MIT. And my question is, why should Americans view uh, the situations in, in Kosovo as different from a civil war? I am not, uh, I am not uh, very sure I, uh, what was uh, the, the uh, purpose or what was the, the aim of this question. Uh, it is, of course, there are at least elements of civil war, what is, there, what is going now in Kosovo. There are Albanians fighting Serbs, vi certainly vice versa, uh, Serbs fighting Albanians. But, uh, 
uh, this fight, this war, this fight is un, un it's not uh, equal, it's unequal. So Serbs are, of course, much more military means and there are, there, there are massacres, there are atrocities, there is ethnic cleansing going on. And this is something I think that um, uh, international community and NATO in this case, and of course United States, uh, I think uh, consider as a reason for intervention. I don't see in this intervention, let's say, typical geostrategical political reasons. So who would want and why would somebody want to prevail now in Serbia to, to defeat Serbia? But of course, it is a question of human rights and uh, minority rights and uh, killings and ethnic cleansing. Uh, which uh, this, these are the issues with, I think that we cannot accept. We cannot, probably cannot accept to live in Europe and United States quite, quite normally if, uh, with the democracy, with human rights protection, and then there is a cer certain border, and then we, we can see some dictator, dictatorship, uh, killing people and so on, and do nothing. So I think that it was, it, uh, this intervention was based uh, on, let's say, values. It was not based on uh, geostrategical interests as, as uh, first. And second, as sometimes people are, are surprised why it happened so fast, why NATO decided now so fast to intervene. I think that this is, I, I call it, accumulated experience with the Yugoslav war. This is why I said, I think that uh, NATO was too slow in Bosnia to prevent much more killings later. If inter intervention would happen in Bosnia would happen earlier, we could pre uh, prevent a lot of uh, atrocities as first and second. Also, uh, to uh, re-establish re the state would be much easier if without ethnic cleansing and without all these atrocities. And I think that this, uh, the, knowing this, this experience was very much the reason for also now for a relatively quick decision, NATO decision to intervene in, in Kosovo. Having this experience with this regime, knowing what, what already happened and what will happen, probably happen now in Kosovo. And uh, I think that's it. Lee Gartenberg, I'm a guest who's had the pleasure of visiting your country twice and staying in Serkno, a beautiful ski village. My question is, are the problems in Kosovo uh, going to affect your ability to persuade President Clinton and the other members of NATO that Slovenia should be admitted as a new member? Um, I expect they will find out that we, are, we can be a very useful member and probably also, not only that we would ask NATO to accept us, but they will also ask us to become a member I think that uh, Slovenia is already now, already now a reliable partner to NATO and uh, a stable country. And n now we are, as a former Yugoslav Republic, we have a lot of experience with the Yugoslav situation and our position is such that it's very interesting for NATO. <coughs> our neighbor is Italy as a NATO member and also Hungary as a new NATO member and uh, we are close then to this instable region. And it seems that this uh, Balkan region or South East Europe, Europe will be a, re a region of certain instability for years. So NATO is involved now. The national community is now very much involved in the Balkans. So it seems that they will need also a country like Slovenia as one, one uh, important, uh, important element of stability and also an example for other countries of Southeast Europe, what would be a different, let's say, pattern or path to, to follow. A good example probably for the others. And on the other side, I think that we can help NATO. So I, I'm pretty sure that our case for NATO membership is, is strong, especially when Slovenia is uh, a really successful country, economic and politically sta stable country, 
does not bring any problems to NATO. Up in the balcony. Yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Vanya Bulac. I'm a graduate student um, at the Arts and Sciences School at Harvard. Um, I'm interested, there's been suggestions that um, a solution to this situation would have to involve a comprehensive plan for the Balkans, including Macedonia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, probably Croatia as well. Um, could you explain what the position of Slovenia would be on that? And what interests me in particular is, are you gonna, in these Washington, Washington meetings, are you going to um, be involved in any planning in this direction? Yeah, it's true, there is uh, now an idea developing that some comprehensive plan for Balkans should be adopted, implemented. But this idea is very vague at this, at this moment. And of course, uh, there are uh, different uh, steps, phases. The first is immediate, how to stop the war. Second is uh, to stop the war and atrocities and to bring refugees back and so. The second is then to establish a relatively stable situation so that there will be no more tensions, no more possible conflict uh, points. Or, and the question is how to do it. I think that uh, for this we need a stable and democratic Serbia. Or if, Yugoslavia, doesn't matter how we call it. But this is in a very, very indispensable element in, in, this, in the stability of the region. If there is a new democratic regime, which is, I say, also more tolerant towards minority and all this, then it's, of course, possible to, to work different solutions as now. And also, I think, then the, the third uh, uh, phase would be possible, and this is necessary also some economic program. Already we hear now about a possible Marshall, Marshall Plan for, for Southeast Europe, so that after this war there would be economic reconstruction. Uh, some countries will be extremely affected by this war. Of course, Serbia, Ser Serbia now, uh, of uh, is in ruins. It will take time, time, years, to reconstruct Serbia, for example. Macedonia is extremely difficult uh, situation. Also, Bosnia and Herzegovina is in stagnation now. Ad also, additionally, because of the Kosovo situation, uh, I'm afraid that uh, this situation will affect uh, uh, Croatia in economic terms, and also Bulgaria and Romania as neighbors on the other side of Yugoslavia, uh, economically. So uh, certainly some, but first, of course, certain political stabilization and second economic uh, program will be needed. And uh, I expect we will start to discuss about it also at this NATO summit, but um, this will be only, only the start of this and there is no specific program now in the game, not yet. You're on the left. Uh, my name is Ron Newman. I, the question I want to ask is, there was a statement recently published on the internet from a group of anti-Milosevic Serbian dissidents that were grouped around Radio B92, which was calling for NATO to stop the bombing on the grounds that it was basically, it, it was putting them in a very difficult situation. It was, it was hurting the opposition to Milosevic. It was causing the Serbs to rally around Milosevic and making it less likely that democracy could be built in their country as, as well as endangering Montenegro. And I was wondering if you think that a, that a case could be made for stopping or at least temporarily ceasing the bombing uh, on those grounds. I, I understand this. I think it is normal. In this situation, uh, you, you cannot expect opposition towards the regime, towards the government inside Serbia. It, this would be a treason. The country is, uh, is in war. So you can expect opposition again after the war, but no, not now, not during the war. 
And now I think that uh, patriotic feelings prevail in this situation, so I am not surprised. And also, I said that we can, in Slovenia, we can follow the Serbian TV. Uh, in this TV, we can only hear, uh, of course, of, uh, about uh, NATO attacks and so, and atrocities. And, but th there is nothing, there is no picture from Kosovo, no refugees there, nothing from somebody who, who lives in Belgrade and who looks at uh, Belgrade TV doesn't know that something bad is happening in Kosovo. So this is their perception and uh, probably the reactions there are according to this. Please. I'm Lawrence Reyes from the Philippines. Uh, my question is, should the same strategy used in Yugoslavia be used in solving the other ethnic problems throughout the world, like the Tibetans of China, the East Timorese of Indonesia, the Kurds of uh, Turkey and Iraq, the Chechen of Russia, and the other countries with ethnic problems. Should the same approach be used? It's not uh, realistic to suppose that the same approach would be used. Uh, I must say, I'd, I, I, I'm not an advoc advocate of military intervention, but in this uh, situation, of course, I, we can understand why, why it happened, and uh, we can fi fi find, uh, I think, very good arguments for it. And uh, what impact uh, will they have on other situations? Uh, probably not direct, uh, but uh, cert certainly some indirect uh, impact, if I say so, for other dictators or regimes in the world that uh, something like this, this kind of inter intervention on the basis, I say, of human rights or min minority rights protection is possible in extreme cases. I think to, to know this, that this is possible, perhaps could, can, can prevent something, some bad developments uh, somewhere. On, and even more, uh, looking from the opposite direction, if now NATO, and I, I should say uh, civil, civilized international, in, uh, civilized world would, uh, would stop, or, and, that's, and somehow the Milosevic re regime would win in this situation, this war. This would be extremely bad uh, precedence for other situations in the world. So this is probably more in stake now than uh, just uh, the, the, the situation there or just the reason to defeat Milosevic. It, I think it's uh, the example for other situations and for the world, which is now more, more important, even more important than this specific situation. Please. Hello, my name is Elsie Sharozi. I want to ask you, um, you mentioned the political solution is feasible given the facts by getting the UN uh, involved and with the Security Council, given the, uh, with whom we are going to negotiate, um, given the Mr. Milosevic's demonizing by Western media, and given the, his bad tracks, and given the Russian uh, domestic opposition to the military intervention, and it's a uh, cause of a situation repercussion regarding the cessation or autonomy for its own uh, minorities and ethnic groups. And given the facts that if we are looking for the uh, political situation, solution, if um, there is not any solution and uh, we cannot back it up with the military heart, the, the situation would evolve. And the, the, the follow-up is uh, whether the, this would be interim solution, interim solution for restoration of the status quo, or there would be, uh, in, I mean, the unambiguous standing by West for cessation or autonomy or independence. Thank you. Yeah. 
Was this a question or a statement? <laughs> I, think mo I think mostly a statement. Do you no. agree or disagree? No. Yes, more or less I agree. This is what I, think so. I think I already said today, yes. Please. My name is James Williamson, and I would like to ask you a question. First of all, thank you for your proposal about uh, getting the UN back involved. I think that's a very positive direction. Um, many commentators have said that this whole situation in the Balkans began to unravel with what they argue was a premature recognition of Slovenian independence. And some have even go, gone so far as to say that there's some kind of hidden, almost hidden German agenda. I'm not sure about that part of it. But I wonder if you would comment and address the criticism that the, there was a premature recognition of Slovenian independence, but first by Germany and then the world community followed suit and perhaps should not have. I'm glad that you asked this. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. You see, uh, sometimes I, I, I say that uh, myself, I can personally be a, a good uh, example of what uh, Slovenia, what we tried at that time. Uh, we didn't t uh, start in 1989 with uh, idea of Slovenian independence. We started with the idea how, how to transform Yugoslavia in, in a better country. And we, and we were conf uh, confronted, faced with Milosevic concept, which was, as I said, nationalistic uh, concept and authoritarian concept. And who proposed that uh, to, to centralize the, the federation, and it meant in, in these circumstances so that Milosevic or his regime would control then the whole country, not only Serbia, but also Croatia, Slovenia, and, and the others, uh, when autonomy of Kosovo has been already diminished or even eliminated, we can say, uh, in this context to, to talk then about the further centralization of the Yugoslav Federation. Of course, it was not possible to accept this from the Slovenian position or Croatian position. And, but we, we tried, we negotiated. I negotiated so many times with Milosevic, with the others, with Tudjman, Izad Begovic. We have the sessions, days and nights, and, and it went on for months even, till the moment when, at a certain moment, the Belgrade decided to intervene in Slovenia. This was the crucial mo moment in the development of the Yugoslav crisis. The 25th of June, Slovenia declared independence, and the next morning, uh, but Slovenia declared independence already six months uh, earlier, uh, announced it, and said it will come into effect in six months. But let us negotiate during these six months to find a peaceful solution when even a certain loose confederation was still a possibility. But we, we negotiated all the time, but at this point then Belgrade decided to use force. And Slovenia, uh, of course, was then in, in, in this war, which was fortunately short, uh, and uh, our uh, independence uh, succeeded. It was, but I should say so, the first, it succeeded in, in, on the ground. It, in, uh, it, it succeeded. We, we, we had 10 days war, then we, uh, we had uh, ceasefire negotiations, and uh, I personally then negotiated with uh, Yugoslav army leaders and other republics the complete withdrawal of Yugoslav army from the Slovenian territory in three, in three months. And this was practical recognition of Slovenian independence. And German recognition followed only at the end in January 92, or uh, the first recognitions, I, I think, came at the end of December. So the de facto uh, independence uh, of Slovenia has been established before. So I, I don't see here much, much point saying that Slovenia, uh, the Germany pushed early recognition of Slovenia. It, was, it happened as it happened. We negotiated, then the, 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 the force uh, was used, and... Uh, if 
uh, at certain point, the, not only Germany, but international community would say, even before, we will never recognize Slovenia or Slovenian independence. What would this mean? This would only encourage, I, I should say, the Belgrade regime to use force not only for this, let's say, not, not very uh, serious attempt uh, during these days, but to, 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 to bring new forces after this first defeat and to continue the war in Slovenia, Slovenia till the end. I'm, I'm not sure that this would be a good solution of uh, the Yugoslav crisis. Unfortunately, this will have to be the last question here on the left, yes? Please. Hi, my name is Beresav Manošić. I am a second year at the college. Um, my question is, what role did Slovenia play during the Croatian War in 1991? Or to put it differently, how actively did Slovenia support uh, the Croatian National Guard then? Yes, yeah, Slovenia uh, and Croatia started, started its path, uh, but at the same time towards independence and declared independence at the same time, the same day. Uh, the war in Croatia was much uh, longer and uh, much more, uh, had much more uh, consequences, many more deaths and refugees. And um, <coughs> Slovenia more or less helped Croatia with political means uh, and practically did not have other much more other means. Uh, to to help Croatia, we we helped in certain certain extent. It's, this is clear, but then it it became much more the question of the international community, European Union, and NATO to do something already in the uh, in the Croatian situation, and even much more than later in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thank you. So, uh, on behalf of the Harvard community, let me say uh, to the Prime Minister how pleased we are uh, to have had the opportunity to learn from him this afternoon and how, uh, uh, how much we wish uh, him and his country well and how much we look forward to seeing him back. So thank you very, very much.